Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs unlocked success and how their stories can help you do the same. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason has built multi-million dollar businesses that have been featured in Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. His life's mission now is helping entrepreneurs live what he calls hashtag the exit lifestyle. Introducing TEDx speaker, mastermind leader, author, entrepreneur, cigar aficionado, motorcycle enthusiast, and host of the root of all success, the real Jason Duncan. The The real real Jason Jason Duncan. Duncan. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Master Series. I am the real Jason Duck, and we have a very special guest today on the series. Today, uh, we're recording this live on October the 11th, 2022, and I'm really glad that you're here. I'm going to introduce the guest in just a moment. We're going to get started, but uh, we do release this on my podcast, The Root of All Success, at a later date. So if you're happening to listen to this, on the root of all success. I want to encourage you to come and visit these live, come to these live webinars. I do these every couple of weeks. The Entrepreneur Master Series is designed and curated to be a 90 minute live webinar specifically for entrepreneurs just like you to learn about things that can make their entrepreneurial experience better. In the case of today's episode, we're going to be talking about creating generational wealth through real estate investing as an entrepreneur. So twice a month, I do this. I bring in an expert like we've got Avery Carl on the show today, which I'll I'll introduce her in just a minute. But uh, twice a month, I bring in a top expert in some related field to entrepreneurship, whether it's around leadership, financial literacy, sales, uh, entrepreneurship in general, whatever it happens to be. And what we try to do in this 90 minutes together uh, is we we deliver you a masterclass, a masterclass of what you need to know on that particular topic. And of course, like I said, we release these as an extra episode on the root of all success, which you can check out at the root of all success.com. But if you want to register for any of the future entrepreneur master series, EMSs, as we call them, you can go to the real Jason Duncan.com slash E M S. So that is what this is about. Let me tell you about today's webinar. Let me tell you about what we're doing today. The topic today, the title of this webinar is Learn to Make Millions with Short-Term Rentals from Someone Who's Made Billions. And that B word, that B word there is really important. And we're going to talk about what that means and how real that actually is with Avery in just a second. But Avery Carl is my guest today, and she went from making $37,000 in a salary to a real estate investment portfolio of, of over 100 doors in just five years. How did she do that? Well, you're going to join me today, and we're going to figure out how, how she did that. She's the author of Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth, Your Guide to Analyzing, Buying, and Managing Vacation Properties. She's the host of the Short-Term Show podcast. And like I said, she went from 37000 a year to 100 doors in five years. And she talks about that in her book. She talks about it on her podcast. She was actually a guest on my podcast not too long ago. You can go check out the archives at therootofallsuccess.com. But her strategy on getting these short-term rentals and long-term rentals, but mostly short-term, allowed her to grow, allowed her to grow her portfolio much more quickly um, than just starting off with long-term rentals, like a lot of people do. The short-term shop, which is her company, has helped over 4,500 families create generational wealth through real estate investing. And today, I am pleased to bring on to the show Avery Carl. So Avery, go ahead and turn your camera on and uh, let's let's talk to these fine folks. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm getting over being sick, so I'm going to apologize for any nasaliness today. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. I know it's annoying. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's all right. Well... You know, Avery, you and I met, um, I think if I, if I remember correctly, it was a marketing agency out of New York that both of us have used in the past. And they said, you know, you guys ought to know each other and you used to live in Nashville. I'm living in Nashville. And now you're down on 30A down in, down in Florida. But, um, I think that's how we originally met. And, uh, and, and then I was so impressed with you and your story and what you, we talked about on my podcast, I've gone out and bought me a cabin in the mountains. <laughs> yeah yeah i think i'm pretty sure i used to live right across the lake from you oh really were you were you in mount juliet Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we're yeah we're in Gallatin, so yep. just north of Nashville, <laughs> Mount Juliet. Mount Juliet is kind of the city between the lakes, right? There's the they got Old Hickory on the north side, and then uh, Percy Priest on the on the on the south side there. So yeah, yeah, we were on the north side. We were uh, right. We our house wasn't on the lake, but it was right across the street. Yeah, well, that's when we lived. We we don't live close to it now, but when when we first moved to Gallatin, we had a house on the the neighborhood was on the lake, but we lived we lived kind of across the street too. So, but it's uh, it's always nice to be on the water. But you moved to much more pretty prettier water than Old Hickory Lake. Nothing, no, right. nothing against Old Hickory Lake, but no, <laughs> the beaches of Thirty A are so, are certainly prettier than Legardo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh... Um, pretty, I would say incomparable, at least on the continental U.S. You know, I'm not much of a beach person. My wife loves it. She just got back from per, uh, Perdido Key. I think it's where she was with her okay. uh, family. Just came back uh, a couple weeks ago, but she said it wasn't as pretty there as it is Destin 30A area. But I, I'm not much of a beach guy, but even I can tell there's a huge difference from Atlantic Coast, Florida, or even Myrtle Beach, or, you know, any of the beaches along the Atlantic Coast. And then 30A, the Destin area. We love to go down to Destin. As a matter of fact, we're going down, uh, I think next month, we're going to be there for nine days, taking our RV. We're staying right across the street from the beach. We we love it down there and you've just made it home. So you yep. like living there better than Nashville area? I do. I love it here. <laughs> it's, it would be pretty hard not to love. Yeah. Well, you, you're in a pretty cool place there. And, and uh, your husband, Luke, you guys have got something pretty cool going down there. So Let's let's do this. So the idea of this this particular webinar today, Avery, is we want to give the listeners the insight into what it's like to truly own and invest in short term rentals and how to make money from that, because you've done this to the degree of, of, of the B word, the billion, which I said in the intro. And I remember if I remember correctly, when we talked on on my podcast, which I think we recorded Golly, it's been a long time ago. You were you're predicting that 2022, if I remember, was going to be the first year that you would guys would cap or, or you would you would go over the billion dollar mark in sales in an annual year. Is that is that right? That is right. As of right now, our trailing 12 is over a billion, but we will also hit it for the calendar year um, of 2022. So wow. it's pretty cool. <laughs> a lot of hard that, work though. Well, it's amazing. Um, and you got started how many years ago did you get started? Uh, about six. Listen, people, if, if you don't think it could happen, you got this, this amazing lady here, Avery Carl, six years ago, starts into this, this idea of, well, I want to invest in some real estate and I want to start a real estate company and a billion. Do, do you guys understand how different, what the difference between a million and a billion is? I, this is this illustration I got from somebody a long, long time ago. If you think about the term million and you put it into seconds, like a million seconds, is 11 days, 11 days, a billion seconds. How many days do you think that? Do you, have you ever heard this, by the way? Have I you, have, have not. Ever, no, I'm really uh, interested. Well, how many days that. do you think a billion seconds is? I don't know. So if a million's 11, how many days do you think a, a billion is? I don't know. Math is not my thing. <laughs> I'm more <laughs> of a marketing, like creative. So you 30, just tell me. 32 years. 32 years. Oh, I was thinking you were about to say 30 days. No. 32 years. So, so there's lots of people that sell them. I remember back when, when I was, uh, uh, uh in my early twenties watching real estate people like, Ooh, I hit the million dollar club, hit the million dollar, sold a million in one year in real estate. Listen, that's, that's, two cents. that's <laughs> nothing. That's nothing. So, um, congratulations to you. So, so tell, tell me a little bit, just give a little bit of background on the short-term shop and how you got that started and what you guys specialize in. Then we'll get into some nuts and bolts. Sure, sure. So um, I started the short-term shop on our second short-term rental purchase, mainly because, well, for two reasons. One, because my husband is a terrible client and he was constantly embarrassing me in front of real estate agents. So I was like, I'm just going to get my, my own license and do our deals. I don't make any money anyway. So if I'm doing our own deals, then, uh, you know, that'll be some extra income for us. So that'll be great. Um, and the shop kind of came into being by accident, because uh, we realized there weren't really any agents in the space when we were buying that could answer even our most basic questions about how to choose a property as a short-term rental or how to run a short-term rental in any capacity, or even just basic questions like, hey, how do you find a cleaner for this thing? How much do you think this is going to make? 
So um, it started with just friends of ours saying, oh, you're making how much on that cabin? I want one. You're an agent, right? Help me find one and teach me how to do this. So started like that. And then it became more friends. And then it became friends of friends. And then it became truly clients, you know, people that you don't know that I didn't know. And then it just grew from there. And I really tried to fight it too, uh, because I thought, man, I don't want to pigeonhole myself into only doing short-term rentals as an agent. Uh, You know, the real money is in selling the big primary homes and not investments. And and I was just trying to fight that so hard, trying to be everything to everyone in terms of a real estate agent. And finally, I quit doing that because it took, this is a really silly story, kind of a friend of mine sent her parents to me. And they fired me. I just sold, I think, like $25 million worth of real estate in the Smokies as uh, short-term rentals. Her parents fired me because I didn't know where to find the serial number. It's not even called a serial number. It's called a certificate of something, something. I didn't know where to find that on a $50,000 mobile home. They fired me after I just sold all of this. And I'm like, you know what? This, no, I'm not going to do primary homes anymore. I'm making all of this money. I'm making all of these, you know, I'm having so much success over here doing this investment stuff that I'm trying to not pigeonhole myself into. I'm just going to go all in on that. It's not pigeonholing. It's, you know, going all in. And as soon as I did that, the business just kind of exploded. And what we do, so uh, when buyer, we only work with short-term rental buyers and sellers. We don't take any other type of client. So if you want to buy a long-term primary home, we're sending you elsewhere. And that's all we do all day, short-term rentals. And um, it just grew quickly. And we opened up more now in 15 markets in eight states. And our all of our clients who come to us to buy, we also put them through a training program and teach them how to manage their short-term rental. And we do that for free if you buy the house with us. So um, basically, and we do it all while you're under contract, Jason, you know, because you just bought with us. So uh, we do all that while you're under contract so that by the time you close, mm-hmm. you have a really good idea of what you're doing so that when closing day rolls around, you're pretty ready to go to start making money. Well, I can uh, I can vouch for for you guys. Mm-hmm. I'll give a shout out to to both Rush it's Rush Valentine, right? I got his name mm-hmm. right. Yep. He he what was the name. guy that we we used down in Florida, and we will buy one in Florida. We we had a contract on one back in January February, fell through because of some of the uh, inspection issues, and then. Mm-hmm. We hit pause because I thought I wanted to buy a motorcycle dealership. <laughs> and that, I wasted lots of time and money on that. And then I used uh, one of your agents, Matt Castle, in the Smokies. And Matt helped us locate and find the uh, find the perfect spot in Sevierville, which is in the Great Smoky Mountains. And we just closed on that on September 22nd. And uh, man, uh, like the the the... the I guess the the feelings of signing those paperwork on on a property that expensive that is the most expensive piece of real estate we've ever bought, even including personal residences. We we've lived in some you know nice houses before, but we've never bought one that expensive because we just bought a big we bought a big cabin and uh, we absolutely love it. It is we'd love to live there, but it's not what it's for. <laughs> right. uh, but we're heading you know we we stayed up there all week last week. Uh, we're getting it ready. We've got, we're rebuilding the deck, putting a hot tub on it. We remodeled the bathrooms. It was not a short-term rental before it was a uh, second home, but, um, so we're heading out there. As soon as you and I get down this, this zoom today, I'm heading right back and we're going to spend the rest of the week getting it all the final details. But my success story, which should encourage the listeners is that we listed it Sunday night on Airbnb and Verbo. Uh, don't know what we're doing. And by the way, that process was a lot harder than we ever anticipated. <laughs> Airbnb and Verbo thing took like four hours. I don't know if we're stupid, yeah. but it no, just took forever. it's just intensive. Yeah. Well, so we listed it the following morning. Like we woke up the next morning, we had a booking. Uh, and we had put that he booked it. The dude that booked it booked it for Thanksgiving week. And we had put the price like double Thanksgiving week and double on Christmas and New Year's week because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And dude booked it for that week. And I'm like, holy crap. Uh, and then we've had two more bookings since then. We even had somebody just message us say, hey, can we can we get it? Are you going to decorate for Christmas? Which we didn't know we were supposed to do. And oh, uh, yeah, so it's it, it's it's not, you know, we don't have enough bookings to pay the mortgage yet, <laughs> but we're working towards it. It's only three days since or two days since it went live. So nice. you guys know what you're doing. And the Management Monday workshop that you guys put us through was fantastic. All the documents that you share. So 
big, big props. Although this whole thing is not really about the short term shop, but big <laughs> props on short term shop for what you guys were able to do for us. You, you guys you. killed it. Thank you. Well, thank you for your business. We appreciate that. Well, we're going to do more. We want to, we want to own, we want to, Christy and I want to own four as soon as possible. Like as soon as we can figure out how to, how to finance them and get up, get them in our portfolio. And then once we get four, then maybe 24, but you know, (laughs) we'll, we'll see, we'll see, we'll go four. Now, what's the difference? Let's go really basic. What's the difference between short-term rentals and long-term rentals? So short-term rentals are typically, depending on which state you're in, anything under 30 days. And so what I focus on uh, are properties that can be what I would call a true vacation rental. So, you know, you're looking, it's not like traveling, it's not like corporate housing or traveling nurses or anything like that, which is kind of getting lumped into short-term rentals now. Um, It's true vacation markets where people are coming there on a vacation, typically not longer than seven days. So technically anything under 30 is a short-term rental. Vacation rentals are typically like seven-ish. Okay. So it's exactly, there's no mystery. A short-term rental is less than, less than 30 days. I think laws change when you rent longer than 30 days. Am I right? Yes. If you ever rent to anyone longer than 30 days through Airbnb or Verbo, get a real lease signed because if they stay longer than 30 days or even at 30 days, they now have tenants rights and they can squat in your property. And if you don't have a lease, then you're, you're in bad shape. So make sure if you're renting 30 days or longer, then you have a a real lease signed. Okay. So short-term rentals, we're talking primarily vacation rentals, which is what my wife and I purchase is what you guys do. Um, Why, why are people wanting to do this as opposed to, you know, any, any, why why short-term over long-term? What, what, what's the advantage? So let me preface that answer with this. So I'm not one of those short-term rental people that's going to tell you short-term rentals are the right and only way. Nothing else is worth investing in. So I actually just closed on my 220th door. So we went up about a hundred doors since last time I talked to you. Wow. And um, we're about to sign a contract on what will be another 54 doors. So that'll put us in the 275-ish range. Um, And only eight of those are short-term rentals. So my strategy and my mindset is the reason people would invest in short terms rather than other types of real estate is because they cash flow so much heavier. For me, I was able to scale my portfolio so quickly because we invested in short term rentals really heavily at the beginning. So, five of our first six investments were short terms. We still buy short terms. I bought my most recent one about eight months ago. Um, but we use that cash flow because they cash flow much heavier than just you know traditional single family long terms to buy more real estate. Now, whether that's more short terms or more or long terms or apartment buildings that we've gotten into in the last year, um, it doesn't matter. It's whatever you want to do. But the reason and the strategy behind me investing in short term rentals is using all that cash flow to be able to grow your portfolio more than faster than you would any other way. Yeah, because if you just bought if you just bought a single family home and you paid half a million dollars for it and you rent it out for I don't know twenty five hundred bucks a month whatever whatever that rent is, mm-hmm. you might clear what like a few hundred maybe a thousand if you got it super cheap or you paid cash for it or something. But you're not going to clear that much. But with the short with the half a million dollar short term rental property, you could clear you know what two or three or four thousand dollars a month, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And just to give you guys some context. So I do buy single family long-term rentals right now too. And it's really just to make sure I have a good diverse portfolio and we shoot for like between 350 and 500 cash flow a month on those. Whereas our short terms, our smallest one cash flows at least 2,500 a month. And that's a studio. That's crazy. What's well, crazy. Good. I mean, twenty five hundred yeah. a month. What, what, what we're, we're talking? That's what thirty three thousand dollars a month. Thirty well, thirty three thousand a year, something like it that. It depends because of seasonality. So that one actually does damn near sixty thousand dollars a year. So in the summertime, it's higher. Wintertime, it's lower. That is crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, and that's what we're hoping. I mean, we look at we're looking at our property and we're looking at what the mortgage and carrying costs are just for for keeping you know owning that type of cabin, you know. And we we feel like that at the rates that we could rent it for, we could probably I'm hoping that 50, 50 to 60 grand would be realistic and what we could clear 
but I know that the the ramp up cost because it wasn't a short term rental. So even though it came furnished, a lot of that stuff was crap. No offense to the people who owned it before right. us, but they didn't. <laughs> it was like we had to throw out so much stuff, and we're having to buy new furniture, new new appliances. Well, not new appliances, but we're having to buy new stuff. So the cost to set ours up is a little different. And I know that you kind of you specialize. I know when we were talking with Rush and Matt. Um, both of those guys, the real estate agents were telling us, Hey, we're, we're not even going to show you a single family home that somebody lives in to purchase for short-term rental. We're only going to show you either second homes or short-term rental homes so that it's not turn turnkey is probably a little too much, but it's close to turnkey, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the most important thing that you want to remember when you're trying to choose uh, a short-term rental or a market, the market you choose is probably the most important piece of the puzzle. It's the, the most important component. So like if, if you don't say you don't have a lot of cash and you don't have enough money to pay, you know, another $30,000 to furnish something. Well, if you buy in the right market, pretty much everything's going to come furnished. You can find things where you'll knock that line item off altogether. Uh, so a lot of people when they talk about markets, they only talk about, oh, the regulations and the tourism, but buying in the right market can also cost you less in upfront startup costs, like, you know, buying in the Smokies or on the Emerald Coast. Your, actually, your example is not that good of an example for this exact scenario because you did do a lot of changes, but a lot of times you can just roll with what's in there because it's already been a short-term rental and it's been being rented the way that it is. And I, we do something we call letting the renters pay for it. So where we'll just let it roll the way that it is, make some money and in the off season, then we'll change out the furniture or, you know, change the countertops or whatever it is that you want to do. So market makes a big difference in terms of that furniture expense. Well, I'll tell you, my wife and I've had uh, some, we'll say discussions about the living room furniture, the, 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 uh, the lazy boy, the, the recliner had to go. Like it was, it was, it was threadbare. It was leather and it had been rubbed. Evidently they had a dog in there that, that scratched mm -hmm. up pretty bad. So we threw that out, but the couch and the, the couch and the love seat were like, eh, they're okay. They're okay. Mm -hmm. They're not bad. They're comfortable. And she's like, we got to get new furniture. And I'm thinking, look, just rent the thing thing. I don't yeah. think we're going to get a, a four-star rating or three-star rating or a one-star rating just because the couch isn't a hundred percent up to norm, like up to looks like that's off the showroom floor, but I think, yeah. I think she's winning and we're going to be buying new living room furniture this week. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of like par for the, especially in the Smokies where it's okay to be a little bit grandma. Like, you know, it's not Palm Springs where everything has to be brand new, totally modern, like decorated to the nines in the Smokies. It's okay to have like the black bear decorations and the kind, you know, that stuff that you wouldn't have in your normal house is kind of okay there as long as it, you know, makes sense for the room. So, so what should a person getting into short-term rentals who wants to, and I know a lot of people listening to this are like, Hey, I've always wanted to get into short-term or I'm interested in short-term. What's the, what do you have to have to get into short-term? Because, and I'll, and I'll preface your answer by saying one of the things I did not realize is that there's DSCR loans, which stands for debt service coverage ratio. And I'll let you explain what that means. But I didn't understand that it's a little different, even mm -hmm. though it's changed a lot because our current administration's nuts and they're changing stuff and they're printing money and it's causing all kinds of havoc in our in our um, in our economy. But uh you don't have to have as much money down and 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 they look they don't look at your income the same way. Like so what would someone need to think about before they invest in a short term rental the first time? So the main two types of financing are really like one A and B and then two. Uh, the main two types of financing are going to be conventional financing and then DSCR. So conventional financing, that's going to be the easiest to find. That's your regular old Fannie Freddie. You can find it any, by Fannie Freddie, I mean Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans that you can find at any bank or mortgage broker across the country. Um, those you're approved based on your personal debt to income ratio. Uh, credit score, all that stuff, you know, they're going to want to see your pay stubs, your taxes, your firstborn kids, blood sample, like all of that stuff. Um, it's also going to have like all that stuff is super annoying, but conventional is always going to have the lowest interest rate. So keep that in mind. It's the easiest to find always the lowest interest rate. You can, a lot of people don't know this. You can get a conventional investment loan for 15% down. A lot of people think that it's 20% because a lot of banks only allow 20%, but the Fannie Freddie rule is actually 15. 
So you can get a 15% down loan up to, they just raised the jumbo limit. So you can get a 15% down conventional up to a purchase price of about 845,000. So that's a really great option. Um, it's gonna be the easiest. There's also something called a second home loan, also conventional products. So again, based off your personal debt to income, your credit score, all that stuff. And that one, you only have to put 10% down, but you have to stay in the property. It's going to be different with every lender, but typically 14 days out of the year. So it's meant to be used as a vacation home, but you're allowed to rent that out on Airbnb and Verbo when you're not there. So if it's truly going to be a place like, you know, what you're doing, you're living in Nashville, you're going to hop over there and hang out a certain amount of time out of the year and rent it when you're not there. So that 10% second home is totally allowable. Uh, there's some other things in there, some other rules, like you can't uh, put any sort of a contract on it that takes control of the property away from you, like a lease or a property management contract. Uh, you can't have more than one in the same market. So you can't go to Gatlinburg and buy 10 vacation homes. Like that's, that would be mortgage fraud. Um, and then it has to be, again, this is not a black and white rule. It's going to be different with different mortgage companies, you, typically about 65 miles away from your primary home. So you can't, you know, you can't get a loan on the house next door to you as a second home loan. So there's a bunch of rules to make sure that you're operating within the lines. Uh, but if you're, my advice is if you're like running spreadsheets on something as an investment, I would just go ahead with that 15% down so that you make sure you are well inside the lines, no gray areas, good to go. That was 1A and 1B. Now, part two, the second type of financing is DSCR. So DSCR stands for debt service coverage ratio. So these types of loans, they do not qualify you based on your own personal debt to income ratio. Uh, they do look at your credit score, but these are really good loans for people who have unconventional income or maybe, you know, you just recently switched from a W-2 to 1099 work and you don't have two years of 1099 income to show to get a conventional loan so you can get a DSCR loan. So what they use to qualify you with a DSCR loan is what the property will make. They need to see that the property's income will cover the debt service, so debt service coverage ratio loan, on a one-to-one -one ratio. So if the mortgage is going to be $2,000, they need to see that you're gonna that it's gonna make two thousand dollars a month, so one to one, two thousand to two thousand, um, to to give you the loan. Um, the downside of DSCR. Well, let me before I get to the downside, you can have unlimited DSCR loans, whereas conventional you can only have ten. And um, as long as you have enough money to keep making those down payments, you can keep getting DSCR loans. Now it sounds awesome. Everybody's like, sign me up, sign me up. Typically, you have to put twenty percent down on those. By the way. There were 15% down products like this time last year, but when the economy kind of went a little wacky, they tightened up and, and took away the 15%. I'm sure it'll come back uh, once things are a little more stabilized, but 20% down. So everybody gets really excited right around this time and explaining what a DSCR loan is. Here's the downside. The bank is going to make their money somewhere because now they're giving you the, the loan based on basically nothing like unicorn rainbow sprinkles. They're giving you the loan based on the idea that you are going to manage it well enough to make enough money to pay the mortgage. So the interest rate's much higher than a, a conventional loan. So um, if that's something that still pencils when you're, when you're
Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Follow Jason on social media at the real Jason Duncan. Are you an entrepreneur who feels trapped in the weeds of daily operations, not experiencing the freedom you thought you'd have as a business owner? Want to know the way out? Take Jason's free exit readiness assessment to see how close you are to getting ready to experience true freedom and success as an entrepreneur. Go to amireadytoexit.com today. That's amireadytoexit.com. See you again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.